Good morning, church. Okay, confession time. The pastor's confused. I'm out there waiting for Sam so we can walk in together. And he's over at First Church ringing bells. You're lucky I didn't wait till half past. We'd have been here at like 1 o'clock in the afternoon. Hey, welcome to worship this morning. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Uh, some of you will be watching this on Thursday. Um, welcome anyway. We're glad you're among us. We're glad you're here. Uh, I want to share with you a couple of quick announcements, and we have a couple of announcements that are going to be made, and we'll kind of go from there. So a couple of things you need to be aware of. First of all, we are in the, the last days of the Operation Christmas Child Appeal. Um, we're trying to get 300 of these shoe boxes filled to send around the world. We are going to dedicate them on November 11th. So next Sunday morning, we're going to have this area just filled with what we have so far. And then we'd love for you to fill up the rest, okay? Um, parents of children, this is an excellent way to teach them about missions. Take them shopping with you. Let them help you pack the box. Print out the label that they can track online. And they can watch where their box goes, okay? Neat opportunity to teach children about missions, Operation Christmas Child and that's all through Samaritan's Purse. Um, secondly, Tuesday night at 6.30, I'm going to offer a conversation in Heritage Hall on the Way Forward report out of the United Methodist Church that's going to the special session of General Conference next February. We're going to talk about where the church is, what's been decided and what's not been decided. I'm aware that there is a lot of confusion, okay? We're going to try to clear some of that up so you know exactly where we are. The following night, Wednesday night, is Trunk or Treat. So if you are willing, please mark it on the Because You Can't Cheat. Bring your car. Bring a lot of candy, I'm just saying. And we're going, we've invited two other churches to partner with us. Uh, the First Baptist Church as well as First Methodist. And we're all going to put cars in our back parking lot and invite kids to come in and run the gauntlet and get candy. Okay? And, you know, if they have any leftovers, we adults may have to eat some. That'll get them coming. Okay. Things I want you to be praying about. Um, first of all, we need to pray for Marion Pierce and her family. Dick passed away yesterday morning somewhat unexpectedly. Um, Dick fell last week. Marion tried to catch him. They both hit the floor. And so they had, they had put Dick at Sugar Creek Station on Friday for five days of respite care to kind of give them both a break and to heal up. And he passed away Saturday morning. So be praying for them. We'll be making those, they'll be making those arrangements. We'll let you know by email as soon as we know. Secondly, be praying for Ron Huff. He goes into Presby on Tuesday for surgery. Um, we'll be needing to pray for him. Also, be praying for our friends in Pittsburgh, um, especially the Squirrel Hill community. If you're not aware, yesterday... A gunman walked in to a Shabbat service at about 10 o'clock in the morning and opened fire, killed 11, injured six, four of which were law enforcement. One law enforcement officer is critical, um, and one of the parishioners is still critical. So we need to be praying for that situation. The other two announcements we have, one is going to come from Michelle. She's going to talk to us a little more about the mission trip to Guatemala. But first, Ralph Aylesworth is going to come from the SPRC. Ralph. Thank you. Good morning, church. Hey. <laughs> Everybody knows um, October is Pastor Appreciation Month for uh, Methodist churches. And uh, Sam, we appreciated him twice this morning, so he ran out to first church. He didn't want to hear about it again. Not sure why, but I thought we was doing the right thing. But no, he had another obligation, so he can't be here. Pastor Darrell, if you'd come up. Um, Pastor, come to us here in July 7th, is that right? No, the 1st. 1st, July 1st. On July 1. Okay. It was right. a Sunday. All right, July 1. You and weren't here that day, obviously. Probably not. Yeah. Probably not. <laughs> so, so, you know... My first process of bringing a new pastor into, into a Methodist church, and you know, we thought it was gonna be challenging. 
you know, a lot of prayer went into the decision. And, you know, we all looked at the, the process. It's all process. And, and what a process it is, and the process works. Um, David was selected for a church in, in Butler, and, you know, he's got an amazing job and amazing opportunities down there. We were blessed to get Pastor Daryl here to replace him, and we was all going, who are we going to get, who are we going to get? And, you know, and, and that's what went on. Everybody's like, do you know the new guy? Do you know the new guy? No, no, we don't. Finally, we got to meet him and his family, and what a blessing they are to all of us. So, thank you. Thank you, brother. Thank you, brother. Thank you. I speak for Sam when I say thank you, not just for this gift, but all month, Sam and I have been getting showered with gifts and blessings, and it's been wonderful. Um, you guys know how to spoil your clergy, and I appreciate that. It's, it's an honor to be here, and um, we've been having a heck of a good time. People keep saying to me, how are you doing at the new church? I said, I love it. If they forget I serve here until after I'm retired, I'm good with that. I'm good with that. So thank you all. We sure appreciate it. I have to go up here because my notes are up here. Okay. Good morning. Um, as you all heard from Megan a couple weeks ago about her um, being called to do missions, I was the adult. Yes, I'm an adult. And I was uh, the one that went up to her and I said, hey, Megan, what are you going to do when you graduate? And she just kind of went, I want to do missions. I want to go to Africa for a year. And I'm like, oh, well, I liked Africa. And I said, have you ever been out of the country? And she said, no. And on a mission, and she's like, no. And I said, you know, that's a whole new world out there. It'll change your life. You probably should do a short mission to see what it's about before you commit for a whole entire year of your life to that and to God. And um, she said, well, how do I do that? And I said, well, let me, let me do some research for you. And I kind of like, man, yeah, you know, you just talk and move on, right? Well, Megan said, did you find anything out yet? And I'm like, oh, yeah, let me get on that. So I talked to uh, Sandra, who took us to Africa, and she said they didn't have anything at the time, but if something came up, she'd let me know end of conversation. One day I was looking through Facebook and yes, God works through social media because the trip to Guatemala came up and they were asking for people to go. And I looked and I thought about, eh, that might be kind of cool. Didn't think anything of it. A couple days later, the first thing up on my feed was Guatemala trip again. And I'm like, okay, let's go with it. So I said them to Megan and I said, hey Meg, do you want to go to Guatemala? You would have thought that child was hopped out of her skin. She was just so excited. I'm like, whoa, come down a couple notches. we got to pray about it. we got a lot to do between now and November. We are going this November, and this was just in the middle of September when this all came about. We came down to the altar, and we prayed that Sunday, and I have to say from that moment forward, everything has been God's work. Everything as far as health being cleared, finances uh, is coming through to certain needs, and you know, my workplace thinking I can't miss work. No, nope, I'm not missing work. It's over Thanksgiving. The doctor's office doesn't open on Thanksgiving, so I'm not doing that. I mean, just so many things um, has been put in front of us that is definitely all God's work. But also, this would not happen without the support of our family here at the church. And you guys have all been very supportive from the beginning to the end to where we're going to you know, this next month. And we just really appreciate that. And we ask you to continue prayers for us as there's still some things we need to get done and there's still some funds to raise and there's still some items to collect. And on that note, um, I did, people were asking me about, well, who is the missions with? And it's all God's children and it's with... Um, Reverend Debbie Hills from Erie is with is the executive director, and that's who we're working with. And there's a Geraldine Trog, I probably pronounced it wrong, is also co-chairing with Hermitage. So we have somebody coming from, I believe, New York, uh, Texas. I mean, there's it's 10 of us going from everywhere. We don't know these people. But Megan and I both have talked several times of how right this feels, how solid it feels, and that nothing's really come in our way couple little things here and there, you know, but very easy to, to, to sort of pass. I do have to share the one thing with my husband. He said to me, he goes, you know, I'm really kind of nervous about you going. And I'm like, Dave, I'll be okay. He's yeah, but Ralph's not going. Ralph said he was going to protect you the last time. It's okay. I'll be protected by the good Lord above and with all your prayers. 
and we appreciate everything you guys have done for us so far. Out in the lobby, there's uh, papers for you all to look at if you want to know about the mission that we're doing, if you want to know about the mission people that we are working with, there's a form on that. Also, we have a suitcase out there. The suitcase on the table, people are asking what it is. That we want to fill up with items. That suitcase on the table went to Africa, and it was full of things that we took to Africa and left them there. I brought it back with my things in it because my luggage got ruined on the way down. So that came back with us. I'm taking it back to Guatemala, hopefully filled with things to leave there. And um, it's just a really a neat thing that that same suitcase is going to travel again, right? Um, so that, we're asking for that too. Pies are still for sale, and strombolis are still for sale. So hey, you ladies that don't want to bake pies for Thanksgiving, they will be here in time. So with that being said, thank you very much. As the team prepares to lead us in worship, let's open in a word of prayer. Father God, center us. Take our minds from where they are right now and focus them on you, the author, creator, perfecter of our faith, the one who loves us best and loved us first. May we see your face. May we sense your presence. May we be changed. We ask us in the name of the Christ. Amen. Good morning. Could all stand and prepare ourselves for worship. Let's see strength will rise. Strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. Strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. Our God, you reign forever. Our hope, our strong deity. God, the everlasting God, you do not think you won't grow weary, you're the defender of the weak, you comfort those in need, you lift us up on wings like strength will rise. Strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. Strength will rise as we wait upon the Lord. We will wait upon the Lord. We will wait. Our God, our God, you reign forever. Our hope, our strong divine. Father God, we just, we just thank you that you lift us up on wings like eagles. Father, and we just ask for your presence, your Holy Spirit, to come here this morning to fill us up and to witness to us 
as we worship you. In Jesus' name, we pray. Amen. Come thou fount. Come thou fount of every blessing to my heart to sing thy praise. Streams of mercy never ceasing all for songs of loudest praise. Teach me some melodious sonnet sung by flaming tongues above. Praise the mountain fixed upon it, mount of thy redeeming love. I was lost in utter darkness. I was lost in utter darkness Till you came and rescued me I was bound by all my sin When your love came and set me free Now my soul can sing a new song Now my heart has found a To grace, how great a debtor. Oh, to grace, how great a debtor. Daily I'm constrained to be. Let thy goodness, like a feather, bind my wandering heart to thee. Grown to wander, Lord, I feel it. Grown to leave. Sing with me, how great is 
You may be seated. Oh, no, no, no. Stand up and say hi to somebody around you. I get so used to Sam being here that I forget when he's not, I need to up my game, I guess. We're going to wait on you for the morning offering, and while we're doing that, Michelle's going to sing. I want to make sure you were here still. I, didn't, I saw everybody else leaving. I want to make sure you didn't duck out on me. But let me pray first. Father God, regardless of what we say, 
what we're about to do shows what we think of you. Use this opportunity to give as a way for our hearts to trust you and to return to you thanks and praise. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. There is one thing I desire, one thing I see To hide in you, abide in you I'm yours for you to keep You prepare a table for me You're my portion and my cup You are the source of strength Lord, you have filled me you are my shepherd in the wilderness, whom shall I fear? You are the God who calls before me, my rock and my shield. In troubled times you will provide, and I shall not want you. Though I walk through the valley of death, I will magnify and glorify you with every breath. When the wicked stand against me, I will follow as you lead. You are the truth and way, the lamp unto my feet. You are my shepherd in the wilderness, whom shall I fear? You are the God who goes before me, my rock and my shield. In troubled times you will provide, and I shall not want. Church, if you would take out your pew Bibles or whatever Bible you usually use, if that's your electronic Bible, that's fine with me, and find the book of Jonah. Now, if you've grabbed the pew Bible, you're going to probably want that page number that's on the screen because quite honestly, Jonah's a little tough to find. It's not a very long book and it's sandwiched in between Obadiah and Micah. Page 1,323. We're going to read the first three verses of the first chapter and the last verse of the first chapter, and then we'll, we'll hear the rest of the story. How's that? This is what God's Word says. The Word of the Lord 
came to Jonah, son of Amittai, go to the great city of Nineveh and preach against it, because its wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah ran away from the Lord and headed for Tarshish. He went down to Joppa, where he found a ship bound for that port. After paying the fare, he went aboard and sailed for Tarshish to flee from the Lord. Now the Lord provided a huge fish to swallow Jonah, and Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So we're in the second of this series called Heroes of the Faith. Last week we talked about Samson, and we learned that Samson was a crackpot. Samson had some issues, amen? And yet, yet God used Samson. Hmm, go figure. But today we want to, we want to consider the story of Jonah, and you probably know a little bit of this story. You probably know especially one part of this story. The whole story begins with this call that God places on Jonah's life. Jonah, he says, I want you to go to Nineveh, and I want you to preach against its wickedness. Here's what you may not know. Nineveh is not a Jewish city. Its inhabitants do not worship the one true God. Nineveh was a city whose inhabitants had persecuted the Jews and would in the future persecute the Jews. They were them, whoever them is in your life. That's who Nineveh was. God asks Jonah to preach against the wickedness in that city. Jonah's response to God's call is to immediately turn 180 degrees away and run as fast as he can away from Nineveh. In fact, he decides to head to Tarshish, which is as far away as he can get. He's so serious about this that when he gets to Joppa and he finds this ship, the text says he paid the fare. Some scholars believe he bought the entire ship. He does not want any chance that he's going to wind up in Nineveh. So he has taken every possible control of the situation so he can get away from God and this absolutely idiotic idea that he ought to preach to the Ninevites. He don't want to be part of that. He's headed out. He pays the fare. He gets on the boat. He falls asleep. The boat is probably sailed by some Phoenicians who are also not Jewish, don't worship the one true God. These are seasoned sailors. They get on the water, and the text says, the Lord caused a storm to rage. We need to talk just a moment about that name right there, the Lord. So in the book of Jonah, unlike other places where you have... um, uh, the names for God being interchanged and it doesn't mean a whole lot here, I'm I'm pretty sure it's very significant. Because here's what you have. You have capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. That is the English way of saying Yahweh, the personal name for God, the God who created heaven, earth, and sea. This is the name that God gave Moses in front of the burning bush when Moses said, okay, okay, let's just pretend for a minute I go back to Egypt. And somebody says, yeah, who sent you? What am I going to tell them? And God says, I am that I am. Tell them I am sent you. That's the name that is here. It is throughout the first chapter, the second chapter. In the third chapter, when he's talking to the Ninevites, they simply refer to this being as God, Elohim. They don't use a personal name for God. And in the fourth chapter, Yahweh is the name that is used again. That's significant. So, so the Lord, Yahweh, causes this storm to rage on the water, and these seasoned sailors are freaking out. They start throwing cargo, probably the tackle, overboard, trying to lighten the load to no avail. They are praying to their gods, and it's not helping. So they, they find Jonah in the hold of the ship, asleep. 
I don't know about you if you know much about ships, but one day my, my parents decided to take our whole family on a vacation. And um, we went to Cancun, Mexico, the first large, big, expensive vacation my family ever went on. I was a junior in college. We go from Cancun to Isla Mujeres to go snorkeling on the reef, which was totally cool. We go on a catamaran, and my youngest brother has the same constitution as my mother. If they see things moving, they are sick that fast. So they put my brother in the center of the catamaran at the lowest point. Why? It doesn't, it doesn't move as much. That's where Jonah is. He, he, he's in the hold of this ship, so he doesn't realize what all's going on up top. They drag him out and say, dude, pray. We don't know who your God is. We really don't care. We'll take any help we can get right now. Well, they decided that's not working here, so they cast lots. And the lot falls to Jonah. So the question begins, who are you? Where are you from? What's up? Well, Jonah says quite plainly, um, I'm a Hebrew. I follow Yahweh, the God who made heaven, earth, and the sea. And they just look at him and said, what did you do? He explains he's running from God, and they, um, they said, well, what should we do to calm the sea? And he says, quite matter-of-factly, toss me in the sea. Well, that's a little radical. The sailors don't want to anger another god by killing this guy in an effort to get his god to settle down. You get this polytheism, right? It's a little confusing. So they first turn the ship around, and they decide to row back to shore, they get nowhere. So in an interesting turn of events, the Phoenician, non-Hebrew, non-God-fearing sailors call on Jonah's God. Uh, Yahweh, um, sorry for what we're about to do. Hope you don't get offended. (laughs) Toss him in the sea. As soon as he hits the water, the storm quiets. The Phoenician sailors are so moved by this that they worship on the deck of the boat and promise that when they get to shore, they're going to offer him some more worship. And they call him by his name, Yahweh. That's pretty cool. Meanwhile, Jonah's dying at sea. The text says that God sent a great fish to swallow Jonah. The great fish was? That's what everybody says. So I had a professor in seminary by the name of Dr. Gleason Archer, and I was reading his book this week, um, sections of it, called An Introduction to the Old Testament. Gleason Archer was, was most notably known in seminary as the guy who knew 26 languages. You would say, Dr. Archer, Understand you know 26 languages. He'd say, no, I only know 25, unless you can't English. He knew things like Coptic, Ugaritic, 8th Dynasty Chinese, Arabic. He knew dead languages. The man was brilliant. According to Dr. Archer, Hebrew does not have a word that specifically means whale. So some people want to make a big deal that we say whale, but the text says huge fish. And everybody knows a whale's not a fish, right? It's a mammal. Well, according to Archer, that's a stupid argument. And Archer is fine with using whale because he believes the whale is best equipped for the interior ride. Here's the problem according to Kylan Dalich. Whales don't have very big throats. Probably not going to get Jonah in their hole. Because, you know, whales eat stuff that's like this big around. I get that they're the largest creatures ever to live on the earth, in the case of a blue whale, and it lives on stuff this big around. I mean, that's just weird. So Kyle and Dalich believe that it was a sea dog. A sea dog is a creature that is indigenous to this part of the Mediterranean. Whales are not. Not that God couldn't have brought one in for the occasion. But sea dogs, there are accounts of a sea dog swallowing, get this, 
a horse whole when you come off the back of a ship. There's another account where a sailor goes overboard, a sea dog swallows the sailor, on board they have a cannon loaded, they fire the cannon, hit the sea dog, it pukes the sailor back up, they retrieve him alive and basically unscathed. That's a big critter. One artist thinks it looked like this. And as Mike Warnke says, once swallowed, John, Jonah goes on the first all air conditioned submarine ride in history for three days until the fish delivers him to the shore and yaks him up on the shore. So you're standing on the beach one day, you know, messing in the surf, checking out the waves, and up pops this fish and bleh, this guy comes out of this fish and lands on the shore. And the guy looks at you and says, repent. What are you going to do? I don't know about you, but I'd be like, yes, okay, no problem. <laughs> the whole second chapter is the poem that, that depicts the prayer that Jonah prayed from the belly of the, of the fish, okay? Whale, sea dog, kind of immaterial, but kind of a fun academic exercise to figure out what it was, right? So he... Um, he lands on shore, and God once again says to him, in the first verse of the third chapter, when the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time, go to the great city of Nineveh and proclaim to it the message I give you. This time, Jonah's ears work better, and he listens, and he goes to Nineveh. Now, it says that Nineveh is a city that takes three days to go through. Uh, it probably means around. It's the circumference of the city. Um, that's a pretty common way that they measure the sizes of cities. Anyway, Jonah walks um, into the city of Nineveh, one day's journey, and he simply says, 40 days and then destruction. Some scholars think three, but 40 seems reasonable. 40 days and then destruction. That's all he says. He does not say, you need to understand that Yahweh is the God of heaven, earth, and sea, and you need to worship him. He does not say, you all need, males need to get circumcised, you all need to follow the Jewish law, and that way become Jews, and then you got a shot. He doesn't say any of that. All he says is 40 days, and then destruction. The Ninevites respond with repentance. They sit in sackcloth and ashes from the lowest to the highest. The king of Nineveh comes off his throne, goes outside, dons sackcloth, sits in the dirt, and issues a decree. Nobody and no animal are allowed to eat or drink. There's a fast been proclaimed. Animals even have to put on sackcloth. We're going to get this right. God is so impressed with what they do that he relents from sending destruction. Now that's probably more of the story than you knew before. So what does Jonah do in response to this? Now picture this. We're going to find out later in the text that it says that Nineveh had 120,000 people that didn't know their left hand from their right. That's a euphemism for children. Children don't know their left hand from the right. So there's 120,000 children. Scholars estimate that Nineveh, greater Nineveh, probably had 600,000 people. A half million people have just repented at your words, at your preaching. What are you going to do? I'll tell you what I'm doing. I'm doing a happy dance, right? I, they listened. Hey, if I, could, if I could walk in here on a Sunday morning, preach a message of repentance, and you all repented, I'd go home and go, yes. I did it. Is that Jonah's response? No. Jonah walks out of the city, goes to the east of the city, builds a little booth, they call them in, in Hebrew tradition, parks himself under the booth, and waits. What's he waiting for? He's hoping God will nuke them anyway he's hoping that the repentance isn't enough doesn't change God's mind 
God gets fickle and just sends destruction anyway. Anything. He wants the Ninevites wiped out. He doesn't have an issue with a couple of Ninevites. He has an issue with Ninevites, period. He doesn't want any of them to survive. And he prays to God. My life doesn't mean anything, God. You need to kill me. God says to him, "Um, do you have a right to be angry? It's very similar to what happened with with Elijah. Do you remember the story we talked about a couple months ago? Elijah's on Mount Carmel. He does battle with 500 prophets of Baal. He's the only prophet of God. They call down fire. Nothing happens. He calls down fire. Everything happens. He slaughters 500 prophets of Baal. He's won a great victory. He walks out in the desert and says, God, take my life. Same scenario. There sits Jonah. The text doesn't say it this way. This is a Greenewalt interpretation. God decides to mess with Jonah. He's sitting outside under this little makeshift booth And and scholars believe that that in that area, the average daily temperature would be about 105 degrees Fahrenheit. To say it's hot is an understatement. So God begins to mess with Jonah by the first thing he does is he gives Jonah a vine that grows up over his little booth and provides shade. And the text says that Jonah is very happy about the plant. He's got some shade. But God's not done messing with him. The next day, just like God provided a huge fish to swallow Jonah, God provides a very small worm to chew the stalk of the plant until it dies. And then he adds insult to injury by sending a, an east wind known as a shirako, which increases the temperature 5 to 15 degrees. So now he's really miserable. And once again, Jonah prays to die. The book ends with these verses. But the Lord said, you have been very concerned about this plant. You did not tend it or make it grow. It sprang up overnight and died overnight. And should I not have concern for the great city of Nineveh? in which there are more than 120,000 people who cannot tell their right hand from their left and also many animals, question mark, quotation mark, end of story, end of the book. Hollywood did not invent the mic drop. God did at the end of the book of Jonah. You turn the page, you're looking for more. Oh, what happened? doesn't say that's it God says Jonah you're worried about a plant a plant Jonah I got a half million people in Nineveh and you're telling me I shouldn't be concerned about them what's that mean means one thing Jonah's a racist Okay, we'll get to that in a second. So here's some things we're going to take away. God's call is nothing to trifle with. Now, I don't say that to say you need to be scared because if you don't answer God's call, he's going to send a sea dog to swallow you. First of all, I'm not interested, I'd be interested to see how that works in the Allegheny, but, you know, some of you I happen to know do canoe and this, or kayak. This could get really interesting, you know. There one second in the belly of a sea dog on the kayak, the next. Well, more importantly, God's call is not to be trifled with because God's call is never for your destruction. It's never for your struggle. It's for your good. It's for your benefit. It's for your joy. It's for your glory. There have been times in my ministry, quite honestly, where I have fussed at God's call. Most recently... I fussed for a year about starting a doctoral program and especially one long weekend where I went to an event and I spent the entire weekend trying to talk God out of making me do a doctoral program. That didn't work. I have fussed 
when God has called me to move. Most especially when I went from Lander to South Greensburg and I spent a week fussing at God, trifling or, or, or fussing about my call and the call he had placed on my life. I fussed in the beginning when I felt God was calling me to ministry in the first place. But every time when I shut up and do what God calls me to do, I'm always amazed at what he's got in store for me. Ministry's been a blast. Five years in South Greensburg was hard, but it was really good ministry. And that's where Noah and Toby were born. Doing a doctorate, to say it was formative would be an understatement. It changed who I am as a person and as a pastor. God's call on your life is not to be trifled with. Now, now you need to get that every one of us has a call on our life from God. In Pastor Sam and I's case, we have to go before the Board of Ordained Ministry and we have to articulate our call and they have to say, yes, that's a legitimate call to clergy or not. But that doesn't mean you don't have a call. Each one of us have a call. It's called the priesthood of all believers call. We each are called by God in our Christian walk to be disciples and, and, and to be missionaries wherever we find ourselves. We all have that call. That's not to be trifled with. Secondly, God is concerned about the wickedness, period. He's not just concerned about wickedness in the church. He's not just concerned about wickedness in America. He's concerned about wickedness, period, wherever it happens. If he's concerned about wickedness in Nineveh, which is not God's chosen people, then he's concerned about wickedness. Also, God is not all right with our bias. As I said, Jonah was a racist. He didn't want a few Ninevites dead. He wanted the entire people dead. He did not want God to relent. He says in the fourth chapter, he says, this is exactly why I ran in the first place. I knew who you were. I knew you were a God of compassion and kindness. I knew they'd repent, you'd forgive them, and you wouldn't destroy them. And I didn't want that to happen, and that's why I was headed to Tarshish in the first place. You should have just let me go. That's basically what he's saying. God's not all right with that. There's a term in the text that, that talks about Jonah's notion that somehow because he's a Jew... He's better than the Ninevites. It's okay to hate them because of who he is. You get that? It's all right because he is God's chosen. They're just Ninevites. And he's justified in being angry. He's justified in wanting them dead. And God says that's, that's not how this works. You see... If God hates all the people that you hate, then God is made in your image instead of the other way around. Let me say that again. If God hates all the people that you hate, then God is made in your image, not the other way around. Could it be that the individuals, the very ones that God is focused on, are them in your eyes? Yesterday morning, a little before 10, a man by the name of Robert Bowers walked in to Tree of Life Synagogue and opened fire. He decided that because of who he was, he was justified in killing Jews. He didn't against any individual in there. He wanted them all dead. He killed 11, wounded six. He was very Jonah-like. 
If you're a person that believes that because you are male, that gives you the right to look down on women, you're very Jonah-like. If you're a person that believes that Democrats have the right to look down on Republicans, or Republicans have the right to look down on Democrats, then you're very Jonah-like. If you believe that because you are educated, you are somehow better than others who are not, then you are very Jonah-like. If you believe that because you are white, you have the right to look down on our black brothers and sisters, then you are very Jonah-like. If you believe that because you're American, you have a right to hate Germans, or Japanese, or Asians, or Mexicans, or Latinos, you're very Jonah-like. Let me really make you uncomfortable. If you believe that because you're straight, you have a right to hate same-sex attracted people, to look down on them, then you are very Jonah-like. Here's the problem, folks. We're not called to be Jonah-like. We are called to be Jesus-like. Because what the text says in the Gospel of John is this. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. This week I was reading um, a book, and one of Billy Graham's son, uh, daughters told a story of Billy Graham meeting with President Clinton right after the Monica Lewinsky thing had blown up. And he was praying with Clinton. And somebody said to Billy Graham, how in the world could you, as a man of God, do that? And Billy Graham's response was, it's God's job to convict. It's God's job to judge. It's my job to love. Amen? That's, that's who we're called to be. We're called to be like Christ. To love the world. Not to decide we're better than the rest of them. I do not want to be confused with Jonah in my life. I want to be confused with Jesus. I hope you have that same desire. Let's pray. Father God, move in us. If there is a part of us, Father, that is way more like Jonah than like Jesus, then, Lord, step in with your mercy and your grace and your call to repentance. And may we respond with the same eagerness that the Ninevites did. May we hear your call. May we hear your voice. We ask this in the name of your Son, our Savior. And all God's people said, Amen. closing song if you have a prayer concern and you would like to jot it down on a prayer slip and bring it up I'd be happy to receive those we'll pray over those as we dismiss let's sing
Father, continue to make beautiful things out of us, even on the days that we're way more like Jonah than like Jesus. Father, make beautiful things out of the pain of our friends in Pittsburgh. Make beautiful things out of the hate that rages in our own community. Make beautiful things out of the pain of those that we have shared on our prayer concerns. Make beautiful things and out of the loss that some have suffered make beautiful, beautiful things. Father, we lift up our lives to you. For you are the author, the creator, the perfecter of our faith. And you are the only one that can make beauty out of ashes. So we wait on you. Thank you, Father. Thank you for what you are doing and will continue to do in our lives. We ask all of this in your son's name. Amen. Go in peace. And may the peace of Christ go with you as you strive to be blessed by him this day. Amen.